right. I'd like everyone to close their eyes. Everyone. And when your eyes are closed, I'm going to say a word. And when I say that word, I'd like you to imagine the embodiment of that word. It could be a sound, an image, a face, whatever it is. The word is feminism. Now keep your eyes closed. And really take one last look at that image and remember it. And now open your eyes. These are two faces that I think of when I hear the word feminism. We have Sheryl Sandberg and Gloria Steinem, two incredible women who have undoubtedly shaped the feminist movement. But the faces that I don't think of when I hear the word are these two. We have President Barack Obama and Parker Pillsbury. I don't know if anyone knows who Parker Pillsbury was. I didn't know who he was a month ago. But I soon found out that he was one of America's first feminists. He was obviously male, and he was an abolitionist and very active feminist in the 19th century. President Barack Obama, I hope, I hope we all know who he is. Um, he was one of the first United States presidents, arguably the first United States president, to mention equal wages for men and women in a State of the Union address. And I looked at these two faces, and I looked at these two faces, and I said, okay, the only difference that I see visibly is some are male and some are female. But if you look in their achievements, if you look at what they've done, they've both transformed the feminist movement. They both had incremental change, social change, in the United States. And so I then realized that there's a really big misunderstanding. And there's a misunderstanding as to what feminism means. There's a misunderstanding as to what feminism should mean. And there's a misunderstanding as to who should or who can be a feminist. And so this, this is a problem, this is a challenge. And I saw this problem, and I know it directly affects me, it directly affects a lot of you in this room, regardless of your gender. And I said, okay, I'm gonna look at this problem head on and ask the question, why does it happen? And how can I, or how can my generation fix it? And that's where something called the design thinking process comes in. I'm gonna talk about that in a few minutes. First, I wanna focus on the problem, but just start thinking about how design or innovation can work cohesively and collaboratively with the challenges in the feminist movement. This is the definition of feminism. You can find it in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and the Oxford Dictionary. Universally, this is the accepted definition. As you can see, it reads, the belief that men and women should have equal rights and opportunities. It's, it's fairly simple, but contrary to popular belief, feminism is not the belief that women should be superior over men. And so then I found these two words. We have a feminist and a masculinist, two words that you think would be opposite, like male and female, but in reality, they're not on two sides of the spectrum. They're not even on the same spectrum. A feminist is an advocate for the equality of the sexes, while a masculinist is an advocate for the superiority of male dominance. And then I asked another question. How did we get to the point where we don't really know what feminism means? Yes, we, we have this definition, but most people don't actually believe that that is or should be the correct definition. And so now I'm going to address the design thinking process and show you step by step how we can apply this process and why it should be applied to the feminist movement. So Tim Brown, who's the president and CEO of IDEO, said this, and the three words that really stuck out to me or human-centered approach. And that's really what the design thinking process is all about. It's a way to solve problems, it's a way to be innovative, but solving those problems through a human-centered approach, being an anthropologist. And this is what that process looks like. So I said, okay, why, why should I use this process to solve the challenges, to solve the problems in the feminist movement? And if we look at feminism in our society or anywhere in the world, it's really just the basic humor, human interactions between genders. And then I looked at this quote right here and I said, okay, if design thinking process is just a human-centered approach to problem solving, then the process and the feminist movement actually go hand in hand. And so this is the process. Very, very briefly, there are many more smaller steps underneath the large categories, but first and foremost, it's empathy. You have to gain empathy. And I'm sure we all know what empathy means, but in this situation, it's really putting yourself in the shoes of everybody else who's affected by the problem you're trying to solve. 
And so when I was attempting to be empathetic, I talked to, of course, feminists, I talked to non-feminists, I talked to those who didn't believe that feminism should exist, I talked to those who didn't know that feminism exists, and I really just wanted to understand their point of view. And then once I understood their point of view, I said, okay, how does that help me articulate mine? What do, what do their beliefs mean in terms of my beliefs? And in doing this, I really wanted to gather some hard data. And last week, I had a very, very informal survey just with about 200 Facebook friends, and I asked a few questions about the feminist movement and what they believe it means. And these are, this is a graph of the responses to the question when I asked, what do you believe the real definition of feminism is? And a few, there were, 4% um, said the suppression of men in society. The, another definition, which they could write in, um, was tied with the advocacy of female rights over men. And luckily, I was really happy to see that 82% of the people got the right definition. Out of the 82%, 70 were female, 30 were male. And out of the 82%, 96% of the college students who took my survey chose this answer. But this was really interesting to me. Only 70% of the people who chose this right answer call themselves a feminist. And then I realized that I did the survey all wrong. I asked the question, are you a feminist, before I allowed people to define feminism as they wished. And so I'm willing to bet if I went back to that survey and wrote at the top, feminism is the advocacy for the equality of the sexes. And then I said, using this definition, are you a feminist? Using this definition, do you support the equality of the sexes? Almost 100% of the people would have said yes. And so I realized if you ask a question before determining the actual definition of that word that people are identifying with, you really have no way to control whether or not people are going to rightly choose the answer that either you're looking for or that they truly associate with. And then the second problem in my point of view that I decided needs to be addressed was the design of the movement. This is the feminist symbol. We have uh, the symbol for a woman with fists in the middle. It's powerful, it's kind of cool, it catches your eye, but it doesn't look like equality. It looks like one, it looks like female. And that's not what the symbol of the feminist movement, the symbol of a movement that's supposed to support the equality of all genders should look like. There's just a few examples. Um, Studio 360 did a really great study where they chose two fairly common images and then they hired a design agency, design agency and said, how can you redesign this image and make it more applicable and more pretty for the everyday person? And so as you can see, these images, I think we'd all prefer to look at them than these, it's just, it's easier on the eye, it's more rounded, it's, it's more nice. And in a way, even though it's very simple, I really think we can do the same with this. And lastly, we just look at the word here, fem. We find it in female, we find it in feminine, obviously in feminism. And no matter what we do, we can't ignore the fact that we think of a woman when we see this word. But then what I understood and what I decided is that rather than focusing on the connotations, the denotation is what's most important in this situation. And so after I articulated my point of view, I had to ideate my alternatives. And so in that same survey, I asked the question, if there were more male feminists, would you be more inclined to support the movement? Or if there were more female feminists, would you be more inclined to support? And as you can see, the answer is there wasn't really a majority. I and mean, well, yes, there was a majority, but not an overwhelming majority. For the more male feminists, we had a 48% to a 52. For the more female, we had a 57 to 43. And I then realized having a larger group of males or females in the feminist movement isn't going to solve anyone's problem. It has to be a balance. And so then for prototyping, this was probably my hardest step because I can't necessarily prototype these ideas or these solutions on a national or international scale, but I tried to do this as much as I could within the New York Academy community and with my family. I asked questions. I was annoying. I imposed my views on someone else and saw how they reacted. And then most importantly, I just listened. And it was those informal conversations where I tested out these ideas and watched people react that I really learned whether or not these solutions would be successful. And last, I'm telling my story. And that's what I'm doing with you. It's arguably the most important part of this whole process because you can create these great ideas, you can create these wonderful solutions, but 
If no one is there to hear them, then what's the point? And so, simply put, we have the challenges of the feminist movement, which I've identified. We have the design thinking process. And together, all we really do is yield wonderful and innovative solutions for our generations and for future generations. And while this talk or anyone going out on the street and saying what they believe about the feminist movement isn't going to solve anything, it's a step-by-step -step process, and this is the first step in that direction. Okay, now I want everyone to close their eyes again. One last time, I promise. Keep them closed. I'm going to say a word, and when I say that word, I want you all to imagine what you believe is the embodiment of that word. It can be a sound, it can be an image, it can be a face. It doesn't matter what it is. And when you open your eyes, I want you to really remember that image. The word is feminist. Now open your eyes. These are the four faces that I think of when I hear the word. All the faces in this audience are the faces that I think of when I hear the word feminist. It's no surprise that, yeah, I call myself a feminist. It's no surprise that, yeah, these are the faces that I associate with movement. But my last question, do you associate these faces with the movement? And are you a feminist? Thank you very much.